The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How could you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Just as we began this day, with um, a confession and prayer from the presiding bishop of the ELCA, we began these thoughts with her public statement. But before we do that, let us pray together. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be among us, that this spirit of yours would be our spirit, and that we would truly hear what you would have us hear. In her public spirit, statement after the shooting in South Carolina, Elizabeth Eaton wrote, It has been a long season of disquiet in our country. From Ferguson to Baltimore, simmering racial tensions have boiled over into violence. But this, the fatal shooting of nine African Americans in a church, is a stark, raw manifestation of sin that is racism. The church was desecrated, The people of the congregation were desecrated. The aspiration voiced in the Pledge of Allegiance that we are one nation under God was desecrated. Mother Emanuel's AME pastor, the Reverend Clementa Pinckney, was a graduate of Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, as was the Reverend Daniel Simmons, associate pastor at Mother Emanuel. The suspected shooter is a member of an ELCA congregation, All of a sudden, for all of us, this is an intensely personal tragedy. One of our own is alleged to have shot and killed two who adopted us as their own. 
We might say that this was an isolated act by a deeply disturbed man, but we know that that is not the whole truth. It is not an isolated event. And even if the shooter was unstable, the framework upon which he built his vision of race is not. Racism is a fact in American culture. Denial and avoidance of this fact are deadly. The Reverend Dr. Pinckney leaves a wife and children. The other eight victims leave grieving families. The family of the suspected killer and two congregations are broken. When will this end? The nine dead in Charleston are not the first innocent victims killed by violence. Our only hope rests in the innocent one who was violently executed on Good Friday. Emmanuel, God with us, carried our grief and sorrow, the grief and sorrow of Mother Emmanuel AME Church, and he was wounded for our transgressions, the deadly sins among us. I urge all of us to spend a day in repentance and mourning, and then we need to get to work. Each of us and all of us need to examine ourselves, our church, and our communities. We need to be honest about the reality of racism within us and around us. We need to talk and we need to listen, but we also need to act. No stereotype or racial slur is justified. Speak against inequity. Look with newly opened eyes at the many subtle and overt ways that we in our community see people of color as being of less worth. Above all, pray for insight, for forgiveness, for courage. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Amen. Elizabeth Eaton. As I was reflecting on the words in her letter and this text, I had a new insight about the text. It's not that it was something that I don't already know, I guess. It's just that I had never really looked at it in that way before. Because for the first time, I recognize that this text is powerful because it is a holistic text about the healing of the entire community. It really represents the healing of the whole community. And the corollary to that is you cannot have a healed community unless all parts of the community are healed. To understand what I mean, you have to look at this text from the perspective of a first century Jew. That means that you have to let go of the ideas and concepts that are floating around that you've spent your lifetime learning and try to place yourself back into the thinking, mindset, and world frame of the people for whom it was first unfolded. It turns out that in Jewish thought at the time of Jesus, there are really two kinds of people, those who are worthy and those who are not. The worthy ones might be called Jews, the unworthy ones might be called Gentiles, or they might use language like clean and unclean. But there's a sorting of the world around them as those who are worthy of God's love and compassion and therefore God's healing, and those who are not worthy of any of those things. In this unfolding story of today, this double miracle is the unfolding of something which is the healing of both pieces of the community. Here's why. Jairus is the worthy one. Jairus was a good guy. He was a holy man. He was a compelling character. He was the um, head of a synagogue, and that means he's righteous. He keeps the law. He keeps himself pure. He comes to Jesus, and he falls down in front of Jesus. That posture is a gesture of both worship and also humility. And he pleads for the life of his little daughter. Then the second character, the unworthy one, is the woman with a bleed. Now, in Jewish thought, menstruating women were to be kept separate from others because the rabbis taught that if you came into contact with someone who was unclean, you were yourself unclean. And Jewish law dictates that in this situation, a woman is unclean. So she's supposed to stay separate, and then after completing the time of bleeding, she goes and is cleansed ritually. This is not a physical uncleanliness. It is a ritual uncleanliness. 
cleanliness. But imagine how this is experienced by her. She has been 12 years away from the people that she loves. She has been separated from community for 12 years. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be away from your people that you love for that period of time? Can you even imagine what it must have felt like to be unclean all of that time, unable to participate in the regular life of your church and your community? Well, we would have compassion for her. Our hearts would be broken for her. We would recognize that as a reason to have mercy. But you see, that's our century thinking. In first century, people believed that she was suffering in that way because she had sinned. There was the idea that rabbis taught that for every suffering, there was always a sin that had been committed. And so people around her, even if they had compassion, they would have still harbored this idea that somehow that's the nature of her unworthiness. She has done something for which she is being punished. That's what makes her unworthy. No wonder she resorts to taking matters into her own hands. No wonder she literally reaches out with her own hand and touches the robe of a holy person, which, by the way, now makes him ritually unclean, so that if he wants to do anything in the temple or anything in the synagogue or anything religious, he has to also go and have a cleansing. She's tried everything legitimate. She's been to every doctor she knows. She's now broken because she spent all her money trying to be well. <clears throat> and there is no worthiness for her because still the bleeding remains, the stigma and the brokenness and the unworth remain with her. Now enter Jesus. If Jesus were like any other religious person of his day, he would have turned to her, cast her away, saw her as unworthy, probably had her punished, and then gone to get cleansed himself. But Jesus doesn't do any of those things. Did you notice what Jesus does? He lets her stop what he is doing. And what he is about to do is an important thing. He's going off to heal the daughter of a good man, a righteous person, someone who is worthy. And he lets himself be interrupted by that. He just stops and he speaks to her. And in that interruption, he heals her. And notice that the healing that he gives her is a complete healing. It isn't just a physical healing. He doesn't just stop the bleed and then go from there. It's a complete healing. He talks to her, which was unusual in and of itself. Rabbis didn't talk to strange women, <coughs> let alone strange women who were unclean. But he doesn't just talk to her. He admires her faith. He says, it's your faith that's made you well. And not only that, but he also speaks kindly to her, and he gives her peace. In this, Jesus is revealing to us that God's agenda is for the healing of an entire community, and her healing is so complete that it is physical. He mends her broken heart as well, and he heals her beleaguered soul. <coughs> and that's when he goes to Jairus' daughter. In fact, he doesn't go there until this is accomplished. He doesn't even start there. But before he gets on his way, someone comes and says, don't even bother, the little girl is dead. You notice a pattern here. When Jesus gets delayed, people die. Lazarus, too. And Jesus says not to worry. She will be raised. She's just asleep. And the people scoff at him, much the way that people around us scoff when we say to one another we can work together to heal the ills of our community. They scoff, but Jesus isn't deterred by their scoffing. He goes and he reaches out to this little girl and he speaks to her with great tenderness as well. Talitha Kum, he says. Talitha is not her name. It's an endearing word for who she is, little girl. Wake up, she says. And she is raised from the dead. This one who was said to be so unclean that he cannot do something that is ritual, he can't go to the synagogue, he can't go to the temple, imagine that, that he has the power to raise someone from the dead. 
In this, we see that God is at work on both sides of the equation. Jesus doesn't come and heal the worthwhile person and then punish the unworthy person. He takes instead the unworthiness upon his own person. And we see this coming to its apex when he hangs on the cross. When Jesus dies on the cross, it doesn't have any relevance to our worth or lack of worth. He dies there for all of our unworthiness. He takes it upon himself that it is no longer a barrier to our healing, our recovery, our forgiveness from sin. This is our God, the one who wants healing for the whole human family, and it is not grounded on whether or not we as a human family think someone is worthy of that healing or not. Now, As long as we recognize that it's God at work here, that God is the one who is the actor in the story, that God is the one who has done the healing, then it is appropriate and helpful for us to see how we can participate in what God is doing in healing our world. We can look at the ways that we who love God and follow God might participate in what God is already doing to bring healing to the world. So Jairus first. First of all, Jairus comes and seeks healing. Now that may sound simple, but if we really want to participate in the healing of our community and our state and our nation and the world, the first place we have to go is to bring it to God. We talk about being a Christian nation, but I have to wonder how many people around us lift to God for healing our broken world. I have to wonder how many times a day are we appealing to God for the healing that is needed in this broken world. But that's not all that Jairus does. The other thing that Jairus does is not stop Jesus from being interrupted. Did you hear what I said? He does not stop Jesus from interrupting the trip to his little daughter. He doesn't hurry Jesus. He doesn't push the woman away. He seems somehow to recognize that to stand back and wait is part of the healing and wholeness that he is seeking for his daughter. And so it is in our lives. If we want to be a part of the great thing that God is doing to heal our world, if we want to participate in the way that God is at work bringing healing to the world, then one of the things that we may need to do is stop insisting that we are first because we are the most worthy or the most important or the most white or the most wealthy. God knows what all needs to be healed, and we may have to step back and be second in order for God to accomplish the healing of our broken world. Now then is the woman. She also participates in the healing that God is bringing Like Jairus, she participates by seeking it. You just cannot escape this simple fact. You can't expect God to heal unless you are willing to seek it. Once again, are we seeking the healing of God? But this woman is a little different than Jairus because she has to overcome the stigma of her culture in order even to seek healing. How hard do you think it must have been for her to go out into that crowd? How much courage did it take to reach her hand out and simply touch this holy man? How many messages of you're not worth it, you are so bad, how many times has she heard those words? How much has it affected her soul? Do you see the courage it took for her to reach out? And so the brokenness in our world, we participate in that by not buying into that message of the world that you're not worth God's healing touch for you. If you've heard that in your life, or you have heard someone say it about a group, recognize Jesus' action in this text makes it patently false. There is no person that God does not want to touch, to heal, and to shape into new life. In July of 1944, 
the Swedish government set a man by, sent a man by the name of Raoul Wathenberg to Budapest. He was to oversee the release of prisoners from prison camps and ghettos and so forth near the end of the war. It wasn't an easy job. There was a lot of pressure. It's estimated that he single-handedly saved between 20 and 100,000 people, mostly Jews, by giving them compassionate passports, by finding them hostels to stay in, or perhaps by um, his own efforts to thwart a plan to bomb the ghettos and just destroy them. He's responsible for saving all of those lives. In January of 1945, the Soviet overlords of the city of Budapest called him in to their headquarters. He went because he assumed that he would be safe because of his diplomatic immunity. On that date, he said to a friend, he wasn't really sure if he was under arrest or under protection of the Soviet government, and so it was that no one ever again heard or saw him in history. After 11 years of pleading and conjoling, arguing and shuffling on the part of the Swedish government, the Soviet Union was forced to admit that Wallenberg was killed in prison in 1947. It took till 1956 for the truth to come out. Because sometimes when you participate in the healing that God is doing in the world, it's dangerous and costly. We live in a world that is vastly polarized. We live in a world of extreme ideas and extreme conditions, and the one thing that all those extreme ends have in common is the idea, the assumption that people on the other side are not worthy of love or respect or compassion or a place at the table or love or or life, or anything like that. And so it is that we also have a choice. We can choose either to be a part of God's healing or not. We can choose to remain a part of those extremist ends which just are eating our world alive. We can choose to stay a part of the un the brokenness of the world around us. Because when we take that stance, it is a sign not only of an unhealed community, but a community that does not want to be healed. Alternatively, we can choose to be on God's side of healing and see to the healing of our whole community and of our whole world. For some of us, that may mean stepping back and letting someone else put their hand on the robe of Christ. And for some of us, that may mean overcoming the messages we hear and putting our hand on the robe of Christ. What will you do?